In just two hours, the Senate Banking Committee is scheduled to hear from the CEOs of America's biggest banks, including the heads of J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo, and Goldman Sachs. Joining, joining us right now for what he wants to hear from the executives is Banking Committee ranking member, Pennsylvania Senator Pat Toomey. Senator, always uh, good to see you. What, what questions you. do you have for the bankers today? <laughs> Well, s several. I think, uh, first of all, I think we know that our Democratic colleagues uh, will use this as an occasion to attack capitalism itself. Uh, I think we'll hear uh, a great deal of criticism about banks for having bought back stock. Um, buying back stock is, in my view, a completely acceptable and, in fact, at times, completely appropriate mechanism for simply returning money to the people who own the company. One of the things I'm hoping for, and I will urge these guys to do, is stand up and defend capitalism. Embracing this idea of stakeholder capitalism actually undermines real capitalism, and they know that. And I hope they will defend the system that has created more opportunity and prosperity than any other system. And it is under threat. Let's, let's, let's be honest, right? A, a very substantial share of elected Democrats either openly consider themselves socialist or they espouse socialist policies. And if you had a vote today on the Senate floor to ban stock buybacks, that might pass. That's how bad the situation is. So one thing I'm going to urge these guys to do is stand up and tell the story that needs to be told. They're in a unique position to do so. And avoid the sort of uh, appeasement of this whole movement that that I see in some cases where I think political agendas are starting to creep into uh, banking policy. So I think on our side of the aisle, you're going to hear um, a, a lot of questions about whether or not social and cultural and political uh, issues are driving the allocation of credit, uh, because it's, uh, there's a concern that that allocation isn't necessarily going exclusively based on market conditions, but rather it's influenced by this other agenda. And, um, you know, that's a concern. So those will be a, several of the issues I think we'll touch on. Senator, I, I think every one of the bankers would agree with you when it comes to buying back shares that that would be a policy they'd be happy to defend. But I think you touched on it at the end that your side of the aisle is going to be looking for much more than that, much more than just defending capitalism and their way of doing business. There's going to be the counter movement to what some of the, the left has been bringing, this idea that woke um, right. corporations are going to get called out if they try right. to appease what that side is going for. So I wonder if this is going to be anything more than these guys are just going to get called in front of you today and they're going to be whipping boys and women when it comes to these uh, bankers who are standing there because each side wants them to agree with them and say that they are correct on this. So there's no way that they're going to be able to thread the needle and walk through this today. Uh, it's, it's going to be tough. And yeah, it's going to be coming at them from both sides. But let's be honest, that is kind of what you invite if you wade into really what are political issues. Um, and in some cases, I think they've done that. I mean, you know, Corporate executives coming out and, and publicly um, disparaging the Georgia election law while being silent about the fact that New York, Connecticut, Delaware, they have less liberal voting regimes. And these, these businesses have thriving businesses in, say, Hong Kong, where the Chinese government has basically destroyed democracy and, and personal freedom and freedom of expression. And, and we just hear crickets about that, but they're going to attack uh, a very modest and sensible modifications in Georgia's law. So it's that kind of inconsistency that um, rankles folks, frankly. Um, so I do think um, these guys will be hearing from both sides. I mean, part of what you mentioned in, in your first answer was just the idea if they are lending to people because they are less advantaged, whether that be based on uh, areas that have been discriminated on the past. Uh, if, they, if they are giving lending for any reason other than the very numbers that you think should be there in front of them, that that's not OK with you. And that's kind of no, meddling in their not, business, that's too, right? Not exactly. Shouldn't they so be allowed to loan to who they want to loan? Yeah, but I think uh, we have to have a frank conversation. So, for instance, the energy space is an interesting case. I mean, if these banks want to provide financing to relatively inefficient 
producers of energy, but they are green producers, and so therefore um, they want to provide subsidies for it. You know, I think that's between the executives and their shareholders. If, the, if that's going to generate lower returns than they might get on some other kind of project. If they cross the line into saying, oh, and by the way, we will not make credit available to oil and gas uh, development, for instance. And I'm not accusing them of having done this, although some do that. They do prohibit financing of coal projects, for instance, so it's not far-fetched. Then, then you're making uh, a, a judgment not based on economics. You're going to impose costs on consumers because the relative scarcity will then drive up the price in order to achieve a climate objective that the bank has established. Um, I, I think that kind of trade-off is something that ought to be made in a more transparent process, frankly, among people who are politically accountable uh, to voters. Um, so, so that's, you know, that's the kind of pushback you get from what I refer to as this politically motivated allocation of credit. Senator uh, Tom Farley here. I, I hey, agree Tom. with everything you said about capitalism and, and the connection to prosperity, but your, your voice is getting a little bit lonely. I, I'm not hearing too many of your colleagues on the Republican side of the aisle. I think about Senator Rubio's comments about kind of a more constructive capitalism, more inclusive capitalism. And also Republicans had the White House and the Senate for the last four years, and it, it feels like that message was diluted. Um, you know, do you feel lonely with that <laughs> message? And, and do you think we're losing hearts and minds that, that capitalism is, is really kind of the greatest good for the greatest number of people? Uh, I, I think we have lost a little bit of ground and we need to regain that. And I remind my colleagues and I remind, um, you know, at our hearings, I regularly remind everyone that when we took a big steps in the direction of greater economic freedom through tax reform, through rolling back excessive regulation, we saw amazing spur of economic growth and prosperity, and it lifted all boats. I mean, we had wages rising across the board, but rising fastest for the lowest income people. So we were narrowing the income gap, and we had the best economy of my lifetime just before the pandemic hit. That's a good thing. <laughs> and it's okay to get back to the best economy of my lifetime. <laughs> so, um, I, I, yeah, sometimes it feels a little bit lonely, but, I, but we, haven't, we haven't lost this argument, that's for sure. Right. Hey, Senator Andrew here. I just want to go back to the, the idea of the politically motivated, um, uh, politically motivated capitalism, if, if that's what we want to describe, or, or you think banks lending uh, or not lending for politically motivated purposes or uh, dealing with energy or guns or all sorts of other things uh, in ways that, that you may disagree with. My question to you is, isn't that what comes with to the equivalent we believe we're living in some kind of free market. Isn't that part of capitalism? If, in fact, the banks decide that that's good for their business and that's the choice that they want to make, is, is, shouldn't that be okay? I, I, look, I ask that as somebody who you know would love more than anything to take money out of politics, but given the fact that the Republican Party has long supported businesses actually being able to do all sorts of things in politics, it seems very strange to me to turn around when only when you, they disagree with the position you may have to say, well, actually, they shouldn't be allowed to do this. Well, I didn't say that, Andrew. I didn't say that we should have a law that bans it necessarily. I, I'm not suggesting that. But I think it's reasonable to put a spotlight on this and to, and to ask the question, um, you know, really from where does your authority come from to raise energy prices because you think that's a reasonable trade-off. Maybe, maybe most people don't think that's such a reasonable trade-off. Um, I, I think we can we should put a spotlight on that and ask that question if we're going to make I think we've got tough decisions to make about climate change. But we should be honest about the fact that getting away from fossil fuels increasingly at, at, is, it has a cost and people are going to carry that cost. And how much of that cost should people care? Who should carry that cost? And what's the benefit that comes with that? All of those questions are really important questions. They ought to be argued and litigated in some transparent public way where there's accountability, I'm not, I'm not enthusiastic about the idea that a handful of banks make that decision. Now, I'm not suggesting that I'm going to introduce legislation to ban it, but I think we ought to be having a, a, a really tough conversation about it. 
Senator, very quickly before you go, um, your thoughts on whether or not there can be any sort of bipartisan agreement when it comes to the infrastructure spending. It, it looks like the Republicans have now come up to about a trillion dollars that they'd be willing to spend. Democrats have come down to 1.7 trillion, but we are right up against that deadline that the president has set of Memorial Day. Just your best guess, not, not as to why or what needs to happen. Will you or will you not, yeah. you think, get a bipartisan deal by yeah. next week? You know, I was very encouraged after our meeting at the White House with the president. Uh, he seemed to acknowledge the realities that we were dealing with, that we were going to focus exclusively on real infrastructure, that we weren't going to undo the 2017 tax reform, that we would offset the spending by repurposing money that's already been approved but not spent yet. Uh, I thought there was a lot of acceptance of that on the part of the president, and we were going to haggle over the dollar figures. Then we went backwards very significantly when the staff came in with a much, much higher number than what I thought the president had agreed to. The president implied that a trillion, a trillion two was, was going to work for him. So, so I think the answer to your question is it depends on whether the president goes back to where he was when he met with us or whether the, the folks that want uh, a, a partisan bill prevail. I, it's very hard for me to handicap. But there is a deal to be done if the president wants to. All right, that's an optimistic sounding uh, note on that. Senator, thank you. We'll be watching uh, the banking hearings today, but thanks for your time. Thanks for having me.